For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked in this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and their spirituality. We are gathering today on the traditional lands of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. Good morning and welcome to our service, January the 10th, 2021. We are following protocol. There are only four of us here in the sanctuary. Garth and Janet, thank you for your thoughts and prayers. Um, she says he sees the end of the light at the the light at the end of the tunnel, but because of his oxygen levels and low hemoglobin, he's having trouble with his energy levels. But they are working on OT getting the house ready for them. Thanks again for your thoughts and prayers. You here at Sydenham Heritage United Church. Just a few quick announcements. One is that we had a few programs over Advent and over Christmas as part of our outreach to the community and a bit different this year. But what you're seeing on the screen now is a picture uh, <clears throat> of what we knitted items that were delivered through the Roger Boyd Ministry. Also going to announce that we participated in the Brantford Food Bank Christmas Baskets program. And on a tip here, I, apparently we give about $200 to that program, partly because we have other things we're doing. But this year we contributed over 2000 so thank you to all who did that. And as part of that, the, uh, you know, I still haven't had a proper Sydney Heritage meal here, and the first one would have been a turkey dinner. And I had the mixed privilege of taking 12 20-pound turkeys from that event to the food bank, which they really appreciated. So although things were different this year, we are still finding ways to reach out to our community. And I want to tell you that coffee time after service is still on. I realized I confused some of you because I used to put a link to coffee time right in the chat if you're on Twitch. And I just can't do that now, but somebody else could. There are two book discussion groups coming up. I'm very excited about the one starting tomorrow on Evolving Christianity. Uh, it'll be a five-week program, Mondays at 7, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what people think of, uh, of my great masterpiece here. And uh, almost immediately following that, we'll be getting ready for Lent, so we will follow that with uh, a discussion group throughout Lent. I sent a message to Cindy saying, hey, can you get this book? And I had checked the UCRD website, and then the day after, Cindy says, oh, you know, United Church has a new book for this year. So I've decided to tell you what, don't buy this book right away. I'll take a look at this year's offering and we can uh, see which one. But either way, it will be uh, a book like this, which is based on uh, a, a page or two a day, story-based, kind of reflecting on our feelings. So uh, the Evolving Christianity is more of a thinking. This project will be more of a uh, feeling and sharing stories project. And I'll tell you next week which book we're actually going to use. May peace be upon you, as well as the mercy and the blessings of God. May peace be upon you, as well as the mercy and blessings of God. Amen. Oh, 
We light this candle, the Christ candle, to remind ourselves Christ is present in our midst. Obviously the wrong way to light this candle, but we get there in the end. Please join in the call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made, a day to gather, a day to reflect, a day to sing. This is the day the Lord has made, a day of opportunity, a day to welcome the Spirit. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us join together in the prayer of approach. Merciful God, you call us to be salt of the earth and light of the world. We confess that our presence is sometimes bland and gloomy. Forgive us when we fail to be an influence for good, when we condone or do what we know is wrong. Help us to flavor the earth with righteousness and to reflect the light of your love in a dark world. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. And here with gladness, words of assurance. The way of Christ is wide. The way of love is deep. The way of grace is warm. And these are all for you. Whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the teaching they hold for you today. The first lesson is from the 19th chapter of Acts. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on, him, on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. The second um, lesson is from the first chapter of Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean county, countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Within these words, let us hear the word of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. In our struggle to hear your word, O oh God, bless even our doubts, our wanderings, our wanderings, our soul struggles, life's deep questions and deeper mysteries. Teach us to love our questions as well as our answers. Amen. You know, I'm really glad that 2020 is over, but probably not for the reason you're thinking. Specifically, I'm delighted because we have now moved beyond year A in the lectionary. You're all as excited as me, right? If you're not familiar with the lectionary, it's a three-year cycle, and they cover lots of the Bible, not all of it, in three years. And they use liberally from whatever they need to take the source from. But most of the Gospels in A, the Gospel readings come from Matthew most of the time. B is from Mark. C is from Luke, and John gets thrown in wherever it makes sense. And this is year B, so we get Mark. And I love the Gospel of Mark. Why, you ask? Well, the simplest example, although it's not particularly powerful, comes even from what we read today, the baptism of Jesus. Now, of course, Jesus is baptized in all, all three of the Gospels, not just in Mark. Matthew, when this, this image shows a dove coming down on Jesus, in Matthew, when he describes the dove coming down to Jesus, the voice says, this is my son, the beloved. But in Mark, as we just read, it says, you are my son, the beloved. And I really prefer that language. Is that a big difference? Not really. But Matthew's voice is directed at the crowd at the peanut gallery, whereas in Mark, the voice is directed to Jesus alone. And I just like the fact the Gospel of Mark just kind of gets to the point. Mark is direct, Mark is terse. <clears throat> Consider the story where Jesus spends time in the wilderness. Do you think that Jesus was tempted by the devil three times? Well, if so, you're thinking of Matthew or Luke. In Matthew, in fact, we get three very specific temptations, and we even hear the dialogue between Jesus and the devil. Whereas in Mark, Jesus' time in the wilderness is two short verses. In Mark, it basically says Jesus went to the wilderness to be tempted, and then we're off to the next story already. And I like that. Sometimes I think of the difference between the Gospels as different sort of genres of movies. Because if the Gospel of Matthew was a movie, it would be a big Hollywood blockbuster. The audio and the video would be exceptional. The continuity between scenes, flawless. And the narrative elements would be woven together so there was no doubt as what the original author had in mind. Matthew also contains a sort of catchy slogans it would fit really well on a bumper sticker. After watching Matthew the movie, you might even expect you could buy souvenirs on the way out of the theater because Mar Matthew is a complete marketing package. Matthew would be today what we call a franchise. And as an extra special bonus, Matthew doesn't really upset people too much. In contrast, if the Gospel of Mark was a movie, I think it would be more like a documentary made using a jiggly handheld camera. In the old days, it might even be black and white. The editing would have been done so badly you wondered if it had been edited. Continuity between scenes, basically absent. And the plot line would not really be explained. It would actually be a little bit like the outdoor baptism we had last summer. I mean, we know who the characters are. We see the action. Well, it's not really action, I'm holding the branch there, but you know the water's about to fly at the baby. We see the action, but maybe we're just not quite sure what the original director had in mind. The Gospel of Mark gives us a lot of space to imagine missing details, which means that the Gospel of Mark makes it easier, I find, to put myself into the story. Now, this is no criticism of Matthew, 
and we shouldn't be surprised at the differences between the Gospels. All of the written Gospels came from oral stories, of course. Mark was written first, so uh, Matthew's version had more time for the oral traditions to evolve. And of course, the authors, Matthew and Mark, whoever they were, they were different people. And the same way the different ministers have a different kind of spin on things, that's what we'd expect from gospel writers as well. Even I admit, of course, there's something compelling about Matthew because we're drawn to narratives and detail makes it feel more like a narrative. But I have to say, I really prefer Mark. Mark, in some ways, is more of an amateur production. It's unpolished, or at least less polished. But it is, for that very reason, more raw, more pure, more organic, and for me, more powerful than Matthew, because it's a more original version of the Jesus stories. As an added bonus, from my perspective, Mark is also much more unsettling to the status quo. And that whole package leaves us with a lot of room for creativity and mystery and uncertainty. Anyway, I look forward this whole year to discovering the beauty and openness of Mark with you. But you could do yourself a favor, especially if we're locked down right now. You could just sit down and read Mark. It's only 16 short chapters. And just simply embrace the rawness and power of the story of Jesus as told by Mark. Our reading from Acts today is also a bit interesting. Paul comes upon an early Christian community and discovers that people were baptized but had never even heard of the Spirit. I mean, they had participated in a ritual and probably even did it correctly, but they'd missed the point of the ritual. Does that sound strange to us? Or does it actually sound quite familiar? I mean, how often do we ourselves engage in some kind of ritual activity and afterwards we kind of wonder if we didn't miss the point? In reflecting on baptism at the time of Jesus, John Petty says, quote, Jerusalem was a company town. Some of the inhabitants literally lived in the shadow of the temple and thousands of people worked there. The temple had its own tradition-approved mechanism for repentance and dealing with sin. Institutional and traditional religion, always an expert at sin, had sin covered. The Lord God, however, was not operating through the existing institutional channels of the temple, but rather the voice directed the people to uncharted territory of the wilderness. The people went there to confess their sins, not to the temple. In other words, the people walked right past where they were supposed to go and went instead to see a prophetic preacher out in the middle of nowhere. End quote. Incidentally, if you don't like the word repentance, feel free to substitute a different word. Use another word that speaks to your deepest longing. I don't know what that might be for you. Perhaps redemption, salvation, freedom, peace, Actually, over coffee time, I'd love to hear what word you prefer to use in this place. But for the sake of simplicity, I will continue this sermon with the traditional word, salvation. Because I wonder, did the people fail to find salvation in the temple because the temple was not providing the right activities and services? Or did people fail to find salvation in the temple because they were looking for the wrong thing altogether? And how many people went to John for baptism, engaged in that ritual activity, and yet walked away disappointed because even there they'd failed to get the point of the activity? Perhaps salvation doesn't actually come in a nice package from Amazon, if that's possible. Perhaps salvation also doesn't come in an instant. Perhaps salvation isn't actually an event at all, but a process. Perhaps the expectation of receiving the spirit at baptism is not actually about being fixed in the blink of an eye, but rather that the receiving of the spirit is the beginning of a journey with the spirit, a journey that may last a lifetime. For Jesus, his baptism 
was literally the beginning of his journey, his public ministry. The Gospel of Mark begins when Jesus steps into the waters, and Jesus' ministry begins when he steps out. Maybe it's not actually that different for us. Is baptism a quick event, or is baptism the beginning of a journey? Baptism, like all sacraments, and like life itself, is a case where, to a large extent, you get out what you put in. So, of course, I believe baptism is part of a bigger journey. I mean, these fingers are not actually magic. And if we had a baptism today, we'd be using ordinary Brantford tap water. But if we are open to the presence of the Spirit, baptism can still be transformative. In the words of Terry Peterson, quote, the spirit changes things, brings life, but also chaos. There are cacophony and unmediated communication, breath and wind and flame and water, all of which both create and destroy. This is what happens at baptism, of course. Gone is the predictable tradition we've carefully built up to control our experiences of God. In its place is possibility, calling out in unexpected ways through strange voices. Water needs only the smallest crack to seep into, and the Spirit seeps into our lives with those baptismal waters." End quote. I'm sure we've all seen the evidence of the power of water. Allow water to build up in a small crack in your driveway, and after one winter, you get a bigger crack. Or consider the river gorge we call Niagara Falls. As far as I can tell from research, the edge of the falls has moved 11 kilometers in the past 12,000 years, and is currently moving at a rate of about 30 centimeters a year. Water is that powerful. Water can accomplish great things over time. And the waters of baptism can accomplish great things in our own lives too, over time. When we are touched by the Spirit, we are changed. Now, some of us, I realize, share stories of rapid change, turning your lives around in a moment. And others of us share stories about being slowly changed over time. Either way, the Spirit brings change. Water brings change. Baptism brings change. Therefore, baptism is not about the water itself. Baptism is about what is beyond the waters. Faith and life, connection and community. Anything meaningful in life takes time. Even when we have an instant change, it takes time for that change to percolate into our sense of self. An acceptance of our own baptism can take a lifetime. Which is why many people, good faithful church people, if we're honest, Understand that we don't completely understand sacraments like baptism and communion. And we don't need to. We, as human beings, are all works in progress. Why would we expect it to be any different with our faith? For most of us, faith is not a magic moment that happens one day. Faith is a long, slow, hopefully exciting process that takes as long as it needs to take. And like any process, there are ups and downs along the way. Well, this is part of life, after all. I mean, I'm a very thoughtful person, seminary trained. I've been in church my whole life. I would say my faith is still growing and developing and changing. But I'll tell you what, I'll let you know if I ever think I have all the answers. Don't hold your breath. And that, I think, is very good news that we don't have to be perfect. We just have to see life and faith as a journey and to remember we have all been blessed with a superpower better than X-ray vision. We have the superpower of having the ability to change our own minds. And we have another superpower too, which is each other. This place, this church, this community of faith can be our support network. We are all in this together and God is in our midst. What else do we need? A new year awaits us all. What do you want to do this year? 
Who do you want to be this year? In what ways do you want to grow? Step out of the baptismal waters and continue your own journey of faith. The Spirit continues, our faith continues, our journey continues. Thanks be to God. Amen. Because we have been given ears to hear the beauty of creation. Because we have been given eyes to see the wonder of creation. Because we have been given minds to discern the purpose of creation. Because we have been given hearts to discern the joy of creation. Let us respond by giving back. Let us now present our morning offering. join together in the offering prayer. God of all peoples and God of all places, we present these offerings that they may be used to extend your liberating reign. With them we offer our varied ministries that each of us may be part of your answer to the cries of the world. Amen. join our hearts together as a community in prayer. We come together as people of God. We come from different places, from different spaces. We come from our own unique experiences of life. We come from our own unique experiences of God. We come together as one people. We come as community in prayer. We come looking for different things. Some of us come bringing praises. Some of us come bringing struggles. Some of us come with tears of laughter. Some of us come with tears of pain. We come with our whole selves. We come with our whole selves. We come knowing that our whole selves are part of this prayer.
Gracious God, you welcome each of us with love and compassion, with openness and patience, accepting us, our whole selves, accepting us, our whole selves. Help us to be open to your infinite grace. Help us to be open to being changed by your love. Let us continue in prayer with the Lord's Prayer, using the words provided. God, our Mother, living water, river of mercy, source of life, in whom we live and move and have our being, who quenches our thirst, refreshes our weariness, bathes and washes and cleanses our wounds. Be for us always a fountain of life, and for all the world, a river of hope springing up in the midst of the deserts of despair. Honor and blessing, glory and praise to you forever. Amen. We now extinguish this candle, the Christ candle, knowing that Christ continues to be present in us, with us, and through us.
Please join with me for the commissioning. Let us go forth, empowered by the blessing of the source of life, the living word, and the bond of love. The one on whom our hearts rely, praise God. Amen. And as you prepare to leave this place, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace.